So, with that great talk, we will now take the next step to our next and welcome our next guest, uh, Dr. Patricia Fracassi, Senior Nutrition and Food Systems Officer at the Food and Nutrition Division at FAO. Warmly welcome. And you will speak under the title Biodiversity and Healthy Diets, Two Levers for Transforming Agri-Food Systems in the Context of Climate Change. So it very much links, it continues where we were. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, it's a beautiful venue and the program really looks very interesting. I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to be here and I'm happy to talk after uh, Francesco after such a beautiful uh, overview. So I will talk about uh, biodiversity and healthy diets as the two levers for transforming food system in the context of climate change. So why do we want to use a food system approach? So we know that poor diets are contributing to all forms of malnutrition. And uh, we know that policy making and the design of programs is constrained often by an insufficient understanding of the drivers of supply and demand of safe and nutritious food as part of healthy diets. So a food system approach can help to identify entry points for actions by identifying those factors which have the greatest relative impact on facilitating change in a local context. So we are, humankind is facing a perfect storm of climate change, biodiversity loss, and multiple forms of malnutrition. We have seen that this form of malnutrition um, are happening simultaneously, and, uh, and therefore it's really important to look at it in, in, in their uh, um, complexity. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation impact the food availability, quality, and safety through the loss of nutrients, but also to the increasing threat of mycotoxin. They also affect the stability of food through the redu reduction of variation of breed crops to withstand climate change. We know that 3.1 billion of people were unable to afford a healthy diet in 2020. And we have yet to receive the new uh, statistic on, on the number. We think that this number will increase. So we know that food is at the center of climate change, biodiversity and nutrition. We know the challenge in each one of these areas, but what we are missing is really to look at the connections and to really reposition food at the center of the discourse. So we need to reposition the availability, accessibility and affordability of a variety of safe and nutritious food that are central to healthy diets. But we need also to consider special nutrition needs of population groups. So really looking at the, the needs of um, young children, pregnant and breastfeeding mothers, older adults, as well as a population group in uh, high food insecurity for the prevention of malnutrition in all its forms. So this slide uh, shows the cost of food. So some of the challenges that are happening at the moment. We know that the consumption um, expenditures um, shows that uh, the poorest are the hardest hit by food prices rise as 50% of their income goes on food expenditure especially on low-income countries. 
We know also that staple intake is closely dependent on the level of income. So nutritious food are more expensive, and what is happening everywhere in the world is that there is a rapid transition towards uh, nutrient-dense food that are also um, that are rich in calories and low in, uh, in nutrients. And this transition is not only happening in high-income countries. We see it happening in low-income countries and in rural areas as well as urban areas. We know also that three crops, wheat, rice and maize, provide almost half of the global dietary energy supply. And the recent um, crisis, the war in Ukraine, is also showing the dependency of countries on the import of wheat. So we know that 36 countries are highly dependent on wheat from Russia and Ukraine, with some countries having as high as 100% uh, wheat dependency. And to add to that, three-fourths of the people that are living in high food insecurity are also living in areas that are affected by conflict, in addition to other uh, issues such as economic downturn and, uh, and climate change. So these are some of the, let's say, that f of the factors underpinning the unaffordability of healthy diet. So the starting point to apply an agri-food system perspective from the ecosystem supporting food production all the way to the actual consumption and disposal of food is to look at biodiversity and healthy diets as the key levers to improve nutrition outcomes and also optimize the environmental sustainability. In FAO, we have developed a theory of change to recognize the importance of agri-food systems that are also inclusive of the most uh, vulnerable people and are also resilient to shock and stresses. So the theory of change uh, recognizes that if biodiversity within and across terrestrial, marine and other aquatic ecosystems is protected and promoted as the foundation of healthy diets through agroecological, people-centered approach, then a wider range of sustainable production system will be incentivized and as a result, a variety of safe and nutritious food will be made more accessible and affordable throughout the year. This theory of change recognizes the, that determinants of food choices are driven by accessibility and affordability. And this is critical to understand both the supply and the demand of safe and nutritious food, especially in uh, low-income areas or low-income settings across the world. So these are a number of entry points in the, in the agri-food system that have been identified to both improve biodiversity and diet in the context of climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Here I want to, um, to talk about two examples of large-scale investments in agriculture and explore how the application of an agri-food system perspective can help to advance a more just transition that benefits the health of the people, especially the most vulnerable, while respecting the environment. I will talk more about adaptation strategies in the context of uh, low-income countries. And this is especially in view of the current uh, food and nutrition crisis and ahead of the global humanitarian overview numbers that in December will show uh, the extent 
of the crisis. So I will take two examples. The first one is about enriching the nutrient content of staple crop. And here we are looking at in the context of low-income rural setting with the high prevalence and burden of child undernutrition, including micronutrient deficiencies. The aim is to promote nutrient-enriched crop with a focus on commonly consumed staples to address dietary deficiency. And I'm taking uh, this example uh, given the um, decline in productivity in Africa due to climate stressors, biodiversity loss and environmental degradation uh, which uh, raises uh, the question on the nutritional quality of the produce staple. And as an example of a large-scale investment, I will look especially at the announced African Development Bank 1.5 billion emergency food production facility that aims to boost the productivity of four staple crops. In this case, what we are interested in is to see a shift uh, to go beyond the focus on productivity and increase the nutritional value of the investment for healthier diets while preserving biodiversity. So, we are looking at this example using the agri-food system approach that I mentioned before. While the entry point is the crop improvement, uh, we know that the uh, technique to enrich uh, the nutrient content of stable crop is based, first of all, on the selection of endogenous varieties that are resistant to climate change. And second, the nutritional improvement is done through traditional plant breeding techniques. Again, by uh, applying this uh, within an agroecological context, there is emphasis that is put on other aspects of the ecosystem. So, uh, the soil uh, preservation and management techniques, as well as uh, water uh, sustainable management. So it's not only looking at the seed variety, but really looking at the context of production. What is being promoted here is the replacement of commonly produced staple with varieties that are nutritionally enriched and, and can be used by the producer household. But we know that there is a risk in the promotion of uh, enriched nutrient content of staples. And the, and the risk is that we cannot replace uh, one staple food with the variety of the diet. So this kind of measure needs to be seen uh, in the context of promoting diversified diet uh, and seeing how uh, this kind of support or this kind of investment can be uh, compensated and balanced by other measures that are improving the diversification of household production. And there is a discussion on uh, how to scale up uh, support for uh, micro-gardening, how to ensure that certain uh, fresh products, fresh food, are available uh, throughout the year, uh, by, uh, for example, supporting uh, households to improve storage, handling and minimal processing. So this is not coming as a unique solution, but in this case, as I mentioned, we are really focusing on a very specific uh, shift to see how the staple food can become more nutritionally valuable and not only looking at the productivity of certain crop. The second example I'm giving is about sustained access to milk 
during the food and nutrition crisis, especially in arid and semi-arid semi lands. Here I'm taking the example of uh, Kenya, uh, a context of pastoralist uh, population with high prevalence of seasonal uh, malnutrition, and the aim is to reduce the risk of acute malnutrition through improved livestock management. The example here is again a large-scale investment, and we are particularly interested at the announced U.S. humanitarian and development assistance of nearly 1.3 billion. And the shift of interest would be to be able to closely link farming and agriculture support with nutritional support, with, with health support and protection of women by ensuring the full participation of vulnerable households. And how can we do that uh, in a way that we can bring these synergies and this convergence of interest? Again, we are looking at this example um, following a food system approach. So, we know that the livestock is of importance in local diets, and the livestock has a, a crucial role in the relation to uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services in areas that are less suited to crop production such as uh, arid and semi-arid lands. In this example, we need to consider what type of livestock is more likely to stay with the household. So it's not only the, um, let's say that the livestock is important, but what type of livestock will be most beneficial to the vulnerable household and especially uh, to vulnerable individuals such as women and children. Hence, the focus on small animal husbandry and small uh, ruminants, in particular sheep and goat. So while in theory this, uh, this model seems to be um, useful to um, support, on the one hand, the biodiversity and on the other, healthier diets, we see that there are a number of challenges in the operationalization. First of all, it is hard to ensure that small ruminants receive the same attention as um, large ruminants. And the same funding in terms of um, looking at the feed and the water availability, as well as the veterinary support. So the risk is when you present uh, this kind of more um, nutritionally oriented livestock support, the risk is that it becomes marginal to other types of discussion and investment put in place. At the same time, uh, we know that only focusing on the production side uh, will not help in ensuring the um, healthier diets and increase the consumption of milk among children. So the, the example that I mentioned before, the case study in Kenya, looked both at the support uh, in terms of animal husbandry, as well as the support in terms of nutrition and food counseling, with attention to practices uh, for feeding and also for uh, hygiene at household level. So back to the announced support by USAID of 1.3 billion. What we really want to look here by using a food system approach is that we close the link between uh, farming and agricultural support with attention to the nutritional support, health support, and a focus on women. So there are some final considerations uh, that I would like to, to bring to your attention. So one is that by keeping biodiversity and healthy diets as the two levers for transformation, we see the extent to which any entry point 
can trigger considerations on policy and actions across the agri-food system. The other one is that working with an agri-food system perspective requires to bring in other discipline, to bring in other stakeholders, with sometimes uh, different priorities and, uh, and different agenda. So rather than closing up, the, we need to embrace what appears to be at time chaotic or even conflicting and ensure that we, emer uh, we embrace the emerging trade-off and we make them uh, fully part of a discussion. And transformation can only be achieved uh, through this continuous dialogue and really looking at the most pro promising context-specific solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, given the nexus you describe with biodiversity and health, how do you see and, and how do FIO work considering um, indigenous people's role as stewards? They, this is not specific to food, but it said that they, they are the stewards of 80% yeah. of the world's biodiversity. So is that something that you could reflect on? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, the, the inclusion of indigenous people, it's, uh, it, it's fundamental to really see that nexus between biodiversity, food system and healthy diets. And in fact, when you bring in indigenous people, they really uh, tell you how much food system starts with the ecology and with the ecosystem services. And uh, in fact, it was really um, the in, in FAO, we, we have a division that works on uh, indigenous people and they really bring in the, the voice of uh, diverse networks. And they were the one that said, for example, don't talk about farm to fork because it's really excluding what the indigenous people are doing because they are gathering, they are harvesting, they are really looking at uh, resources and the use of these resources in the context. So they can bring a very important um, perspective and they need to be at the center of this discussion because of that. Mm. And do you also work, uh, considering now the work on the next biodiversity framework, is FIO involved in that? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There is the, again, I mean, we have uh, a large division that is working both at climate change, but also biodiversity, and this will be, um, I think there will be a publication coming out on, uh, on that very soon. Mm. Thanks, we look forward to that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.